Welcome everybody to our latest New South Wales Public Libraries Author Talk. We've got people here from almost 60 different public libraries joining us and we're so glad that you're all here. If you've got any questions for our author this evening, just type them into the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen and we'll get to them towards the end of the hour. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land which each of us are on. I pay respect to Aboriginal elders past, present and emerging, and I celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal cultures and languages across Australia. I'm on Gurungai country and I invite each of you to acknowledge the country where you are. My name is Melanie and I'm the Programs Coordinator at Hornsby Library in the north of Sydney. It's my pleasure to introduce you all to Samuel Johnson, actor, Gold Logie winner and co-founder of Love Your Sister, Australia's hardest working cancer vanquishing charity. Tonight, Samuel is here to share the story behind Dear Mum, a collection of letters to mums written by a who's who of Australians. Every sale of this book contributes to cancer research. Welcome, Samuel, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I, really, I'm a community guy, and um, since COVID, I've I've been curtailed somewhat in terms of my community engagements, and I feel like I'm reconnecting now. So, um, without meaning to sound too gushy, I'm really thrilled to be here. I'm honoured to be here, and thank you for having me. Thank you, Samuel. Um, we're here to talk about your new book, Dear Mum which we've got a copy of, although that's what I was saying to Sarah before, yeah, Sam's copy is the real copy and my copy is a fake copy because it's actually not in the shops yet, but I wanted you to know what it looked like. Um, so like we say, the book is so new that it's not even in the shops, but we're doing a little bit of a sneaky preview tonight. But before we start talking about the book, I wanted to talk about how we came to be here. Now, Samuel, audiences know you for so many different reasons. They might know you as an actor, they might know you for your voiceover work, for Dancing with the Stars or as an advocate. When somebody approaches you on the street, what do they usually want to speak with you about? Um, oh, look, thankfully, it's changed over the years. <laughs> um, I used to just be that um, that guy off the tally and um, that that's enough to be an object of derision um, and... So certainly I, I, I had my first taste of public life as a 15 year old when I did a, like a six week spot on Home and Away and, and, and my life changed radically then. And then when I was 21, I got a job on a TV show called The Secret Life of Us, which was quite popular at the time. And I had another taste of public life then. Um, and most, you know, for 20 years of my life, I've been the guy off that show or, um, or the actor that was in and, and that always felt a little wrong um, because I never really saw myself as an actor. That's not how I identified with myself. I saw myself much more as a reader or a writer or, you know, something else. So I ended up in this kind of, in this kind of wonderful position where I could exploit my profile to subsidize my other pursuits. Um, but uh, at the same time, um, it, it kind of felt weird when people would yell out a character name or call me by a different name or, or, or assume that I had the same characteristics as a certain character that they either did or didn't like. Either way, I felt like I was getting lost in translation and that it was all about something else that didn't really have a lot to do with me. And then when my sister got sick with cancer about eight or nine years ago, um, she wanted me to go public with her story. And despite my unwillingness, she talked me around. Um, I was worried about the Pandora's box thing. I was like, well, once you open it, you can't close it. And you, you're going to have to have a public death if you want to have a public illness. Um, and so I, was, I tried to warn her of the perils of public life um, because there are some, believe it or not. I don't want to, I don't want to seem ungrateful. Um, but, um, but then things started changing. Um, now, now I only ever get acknowledged as a brother. Um, I never get called Molly Meldrum or, or the guy that was Molly or, or like people rarely bring up my TV work. They, um, now when I go out, um, it's hugs all around. Um, complete strangers coming up and hugging me and thanking me for fighting to keep our family safe. And um, even just... Like two days ago, I was going through a Macca's drive through to get my partner a, a, a frozen Coke because she, she loves the frozen Cokes. And, um, and I got to the window and the car ahead of me had already paid for it. Um, oh. I, like maybe, maybe every third time I go and pay for my fuel in my car, 
um, I go to the desk and they say, sorry, that person already paid for it. And it's someone driving away. And half the time when I fill my car full of fuel, I'm chasing people down the street to try and thank them for, um, for showing such love and kindness. So what started off as something quite jarring and hard to understand has ended up being something quite beautiful and lovely. And it's, it's, it's uh, now it's just, pure generosity uh towards me as a little brother um i'm i'm i I very rarely do i get any showbiz questions anymore i'm glad that that's the experience you're having it's been interesting to me when i've been telling people that i was doing this event like just how warmly people feel about you and how excited people were to know that i'd get to meet you or that you know they'd get to come and watch the event there's so much goodwill towards you out there I was, um, a, I, I was a pessimist. I was a pessimist. I like, I was so cynical. I'd been in showbiz for 20 years. I didn't really trust people. I'd, I'd, I'd really kind of developed a lot of cynicism and a lot of pessimism. And, um, and I found the whole experience rather disconcerting to say the least. And, and for it to turn around in the way it has, I just thank my sister for opening up Pandora's box because, because it's been, it was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. And now for me, public life is something to be treated cherished and it's a responsibility that I'm so grateful for and I try always to to never let the community that I'm representing down and it's led to me making a lot of life choices that are better for me so rather than being on a self-destructive showbiz kind of um, you know imposter syndrome laden kind of confused kind of no identity I'm nothing more than the the you know than all the parts that I've played you know just getting lost in the fiction of it all I've been able to emerge with a real sense um um of family and of uh, brotherhood and sisterhood and and uh, yeah my life's changed completely and now I'm hopeful and optimistic and full of love because I've received such kindness my life really has gone from being dark and negative to really light and really positive and I never thought that would happen because my cynicism was so firmly entrenched. I'm I'm genuinely so happy to hear that you know I was thinking but like my brother is is pretty great but I'm not convinced he'd hop on his scooter to go down to the corner shop to get me a packet of chips I'm pretty confident that he would not unicycle around the country for me so I think there's something pretty special in that. Well, I mean, it might be a testament to my sister's bossiness rather than my rather than my persistence, but uh, <laughs> but I, I, either way, it does look good on the resume. <laughs> so your role as a cancer vanquisher, as we've touched on, began when your beautiful sister Connie was diagnosed. Can you tell us a little bit about the Love Your Sister charity that you set up together? Sure. Yeah, my sister first got diagnosed with cancer as an eleven-year-old with a really chronic cancer. Uh, and then as a 22 year old, um, she got cancer in her womb. And then as a 33 year old, she got cancer in her breasts and that proliferated and she died uh, about five years after di- being diagnosed with a couple of young kids. Um, when she was fresh off her terminal diagnosis, she begged me to leverage my public profile to try and raise a million dollars for cancer research because she was searching for some meaning in all the madness. Um, and, and, and I'm so grateful that she was clutching in that way at that time. Um, as much as I resisted initially because I didn't want to air our dirty laundry in public, um, she was right to persist and to encourage me forward. And she decided the best and most effective way that we could raise a million dollars, which was our goal at the time, was to hop on a one-wheeled bike, a unicycle, and to travel around the country and break the world record for longest distance travelled on a unicycle. That took me 364 days. I travelled 16,000 kilometres on one wheel. And I visited hundreds of communities and I came back with $1.4 million in the bank thinking that I'd ticked the good brother box. Um, To my surprise and at the time my chagrin, um, I was just off the unicycle trying to enjoy my first beer (laughs) and she looked at me and said, so what next? And I was deeply offended I said, what next is you tell me how proud of me you are. You tell me what a great job I've done and you let me get on with my life. That's what's next, honey. How dare you ask that? Where's my congratulations? Why aren't you saying well done? I was devastated. And she said, and it was one of the sentences that, you know, changed my life. Um, 
She said, Sam, it's not over when you get off the unicycle and it's not over when I die. It's over when we stop losing mums to cancer. And that was a comeuppance. That was a reality check. That was like, oh, you want your congratulations, do you? What about all the mums still dying? I, I believe it's bigger than you, Sam. You know, so we had a stoush within an hour of me arriving back home. It wasn't the fairy tale end that I planned with her crying and telling me how proud she was of me, but it was much richer than that. And, and, and within an hour of getting off the unicycle, I said, okay, let's raise 10 million. And I doubled down and, and, and I wasn't able to keep my promise of raising 10 million before she died. But when she died, she knew I was good for it. And we reached that target within 18 months of her death. And our charity has only gone stronger since she's gone, which is um, to my surprise, because I was worried that we would wilt and die after she did. Um, so, I'm so I'm so encouraged um, by the fact that we've still got strong support, even though we've lost our Queen Bay. Yeah, well, that's we were all so sad to, to see it when, when Connie died because she was just lovely. <clears throat> I beg your pardon. Um, and, you know, she really touched a lot of people's hearts, I think. But like you say, the charity has continued on and not only did you raise that $10 million, you actually have raised $13.1 million, which is just unbelievable. Like congratulations to you and to everybody who's had a hand in that. Well, as my as my sister Connie used to say when she was alive, that Sam, it's not your money. You didn't raise it. Sorry, but when did you open your wallet and sign a check for thirteen point one million dollars? It's not your money. Don't ever think this has got anything to do with you. You're just you're just the conduit. So you know, I it's wrong of me to sit here and think that I've raised thirteen point one million dollars. I've certainly advocated and encouraged people to donate, and I'm I'm a very small part of a big army. And, and some of us get more attention than others. And there's a lot of silent heroes that, that I mean, we have 1500 volunteers that are working tooth and nail and they don't get the luxury of talking to you and talking to all the people at the libraries, you know, yeah. so I, in a way I get the best of it and I get a lot more credit than I'm due because there's so many people responsible for it. So when you say well done and great result, I agree. And well done to Connie for getting me out there and, and for all the people that have mentored me and for all, all of the volunteers and the people that have fundraised in communities everywhere. I know there are so many people listening that have raised money for us. They're watching right now and they're in, cause I've been to all the communities that your libraries are in. And um, I know that many people watching have had face to face time with me and, and they're the people that deserve the congratulations because they're the people that the scientists and the researchers that we fund and support. They're the people that the scientists and researchers ask me to thank. They don't yeah. thank me. They ask me to pass on their thanks to our donors. So I'm glad to be in the middle of it, but I'm reticent to give myself too much credit. Oh, thank you, Sam. But I, I don't know. I think that, you know, I think a good amount of credit. I'm a megaphone. Due, I'm a megaphone. I can, I, can, <laughs> I can kind of, I see myself as a megaphone. I can try and yell it from the rafters and try and get as many people to listen as po possible and try and leverage my public profile and try and come up with great ideas for fundraising and to never do the same thing twice and to pass on 100% of donations because other charities are too busy dipping in to pay for their own admin and their own photocopying and their own wages and their own exorbitant CEOs. You know, I stand proudly in the not-for-profit space as someone that doesn't spend any donated dollar on themselves. I'm proud to come up with new fundraising ideas every year and not to do the same thing until it peters out and dies the average not-for-profit lasts seven to eight years and then they die i mean you know i mean we can think of daffodil day they used to make a lot of money for the cancer council it costs them a quarter of a million now yeah and they still do it the same old idea that we're all tired of I mean, yeah. do you know what I mean? And I'm saying, I mean, I mean, SIDS, we got away with SIDS and we kind of, we found a way to cure it. So, but, but the red noses had faded off long before we had, we had kind of made that progress. So I'm terrified when I'm trying to create a legacy for my sister, I'm terrified of doing the same thing repeat and repeating and losing and, and, and losing that spontaneity. So I just try and sanctify the donor dollar make sure that we don't spend any of the donated dollar and come up with new fundraising ideas every time so that we don't ever get boring for people. And that's my obsession. And that way I can try and reach, say, somewhere where Fred Hollows has gone. Because Fred Hollows is the benchmark. I mean, he has cured 6 million people from blindness, right? And he died a long time ago and he's still curing people. 
like he created a legacy. He created a charity that still does the work so long after he has passed. So, you know, I'm, I don't want to go the way of Daffodil Day. I want to go the way of Fred Hollows and I want to, and because and, that's what my sister asked me to do. Well, I think there's little chance of that. Um, we were saying when we um, were talking before we started the broadcast, when I went to look at the website when I was starting to, to prepare for tonight, I was really blown away by how much it made me smile. Um, I guess I anticipated that it might be a little bit dry or a little bit sad, but it's very funny and well written. And I love the sorts of fundraising ideas you've got on there. Um, there's a swear jar, and that's I, I said to Sam that if I bought the swear jar, I might as well hand you my credit card because that would not do very well for me. But there's five cent Fridays, there's opportunity to do funeral giving. There's amazing things there. What yeah. what do you find people are responding to? Um, all of it. Um, there's so many, I mean, this is why we provide so many ways for people to help because everybody's needs are different. Um, so, I mean, if, if you want to be a casual supporter, you can be. Um, if you want to become more a part of our community, then you can do that without having to raise money at all. You can be here without having to raise money. The pressure is not on people to raise money. The, the uh, you know, our expectation is that we're all here first as family and friends, uh, as people that understand that there's other families going through this same stuff. So we're much more a village before we're a fundraising agent or a, or a, or a charity. I see us more as a community rather than a charity. And our job primarily is to look after each other. So we must look out for each other. We're not allowed to bring each other down. We put up with no nonsense in our community. There's absolutely, you've got to be there for others. That's the number one rule, the ethos that, under, that underscores and underpins everything that we do. We must, if, if our number one rule is be decent, be kind, okay? There's too much harshness in the world. You know, we're already struggling with our various problems. Here, I mean, it's not a safe space. I hope that we can challenge each other and be more interesting than a safe space. You know, we'll say what we think as well. Um, but, but my focus has been on togetherness, not on fundraising. And the fundraising has happened because I'm not predatory when it comes to money. You know, I'm not like these other charities saying, give us 60 bucks a month and, and clear your conscience. I mean, for crying out loud, you know, I mean, for me, there's a reason why people distrust charities and that's because charities are kind of a bit heavy handed. So, and, and too often they're spending too much money on themselves and, 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 you know, traveling the higher road and being a bit pious and, you know, I'm sick of photos of bald kids and I'm sick of photos of African kids with flies around their mouths and distended stomachs, you know, stop trying to, tug at my heartstrings we try and first and foremost be a place where we can talk about our illnesses and try and get the best treatments and try and make sure we're supported and try and make sure that the ones that, that are falling through the cracks have got someone to, that they can talk to and then we concentrate on school visits hospital visits community engagements and then we focus on fundraising if you've got a spare coin so you, you won't often hear me say please donate <laughs> No, but I, I think that that's probably one of the reasons why people have responded so well. Yeah, I, look, I like to think so, but it's hard to measure and it's not really yeah. tangible. Now, Sam, sharing stories is something that runs in your family. Your dad was a writer and he owned a bookshop. Your mum was a poet. Your sister's a writer too. Has books and reading always been a big part of your life? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that because I'm, I'm so used to talking about cancer and books is my <laughs> other big passion. Um, my dad was a novelist. My mum was a poet. I was brought up without a television. Uh, it, my dad thought it was a narcotic for the masses and, um, and he was a literate man. And he brought me up in a house. We were broke, but he had money for books. And so he collected Australian fiction and he collected the first editions. So my dad ended up over a series of decades um, amassing the most impressive collection of Australian fiction in the world. He had the best collection in the world. And, and we would move because my mum died when I was very young. My dad had to support us three kids. So he would renovate houses by day and write books by night to support us. And, and, and so I, I was brought up in a land of books. And, and when dad was writing at night on his typewriter, you didn't dare knock on the door and make a noise because that was sacred time. And he only ever wanted me to be a writer. And, um, and, and acting, um, a, acting, I ended up being an actor on television. And of course, as I just told you, he didn't think much of the television. So, so 
you know, I suppose he, he, I suppose I've been brought up around books and I love words and, you know, I mean, I love David Astle because he loves words more than I do and it's good to know where you stand. Um, and, and, and really it was my love of words and stories that kind of led me down the garden path that was acting. So really everything stems back to my love of reading and writing. Um, I think stories are the only thing that we have to create the fabric that identifies us. Stories are, you know, if you look at, um, I, I cannot speak for the indigenous people. I've done a lot of remote communities and spoken to them. And I can say that their emphasis uh, on story and their, um, the way they, um, uh, the way the indigenous treat um, um, kind of dream time and, and, and storytelling, it's such a sacred part of their culture. And, and so that's rubbed off on me. I did some travels when I was young in Japan. Um, they've got a strong culture um, around stories and fables. And, and of course my dad raised me on stories. It's all I had to do as a kid was to read. So as a kid, you know, I kind of graduated from Roald Dahl to Dickens. And I was, I, I like to joke that I was weaned on the classics, but that would suggest that I'm a bit more highbrow than I actually am. I kind of, I kind of fell off the, I fell off the, um, I fell off the train as a teenager and, and, and didn't, and didn't rediscover literature for a good couple of decades. And for that, couple of decades I was lost and and until I read again until I wrote again I, I was never going to be found so so not only um, are books and words the most important thing that I ever grew up on but they're the thing that saved me as an adult when it came to trying to rescue um, myself from the errors of my ways. When you've got time to read now for pleasure what do you like to read? Um, I'm trying to reread everything I read when I was a kid um, in an effort um, to relearn it all. Um, but I would say um, it's quite broad. Um, my dad gave up on fiction when he was about 50. He said, Sam, I wasted my life on fiction. <laughs> and, and, and he went over to nonfiction quite militantly. Um, I, I made sure I didn't waste so much time with fiction and that I got onto nonfiction earlier. And I'd say that nonfiction is probably what really propels me now. But at the same time, I'm going to stop for Boy Swallows Universe. I'm going to stop for the, you know, for the for those novels that must be read. But um, to be honest, I'm in a learning phase, so nonfiction it is for me. Yeah, well, I think you're not alone there. Reading narrative nonfiction is such a huge draw card for us at the library. And, That's and a lot of people want that. And also, I've spent so much time with fiction as an actor, as a reader. You know, I've spent my life in kind of make believe and in pretendies. Um, so it's it's good for me to ground myself in some facts because I've spent so much time in the clouds. Fair enough. Now, it's I wanted to bring us around now to actually talk about the book that we're here yeah. to talk about. So, like I said earlier, it all really started with the first in the series, which was Dear Santa, which was you know, a collection of letters people wrote to Santa. And now we've come around to this one that is called Dear Mum. So can you tell us a little bit about... Uh, and um, in between, in between, we had Dear Dad. There's Dear Dad? Yeah. And so there was Dear got... Santa, there was Dear Dad, and then there was Heroes Next Door, which I wrote, oh. with, which I wrote with my sister. And, and the fourth book in the series is The Ace Up the Sleeve, Dear Mum. We've been waiting for this one. Every, all of these le were leading to this one. We knew it when we started Dear Santa because our village comprises of about 850,000 Australians and 84% of them are women and mums. So we are predominantly, in terms of the Love Your Sister village, we are predomin predominantly women and mums. So I knew that we had to take great care when it came to assembling this, um, um, this group of letters because... I'm speaking very directly to our villagers with this one. I had to get it right. Yeah, I, I think you did. I found it um, to be a really beautiful and moving book and it's so rich in that you, there are so many different stories and so many different types of stories. There's, there's really funny stories, there's really sad stories, there's people who lost their mums, people who never knew their mums, you know, um, and it's, it's a really wonderful thing. And what's nice about it being a collection of letters is it's a nice thing to dip in and out of as you've got, you know, as you've got a moment here and there. 
Reading's reading is piecemeal more and more these days. And um, I want to, I want to create stuff that people will read. Um, it's very hard to ask someone for hours of their time to read a single story. Um, I'm not sure that my narrative skills could even cater to that at this point. Um, so I'm looking to, to tickle people's hearts and minds um, in the in-between times. I hope that people would have it in their toilet. I hope that people would have it on their uh, coffee table. I hope that they'd be reading it while they wait two minutes for the egg to boil because there's, there's, you can open it up. You can get a, they're mostly, they're pretty short. Um, and we have a need for long form and we have a need for short form. And I'm not sure there's enough short form reading around for us. I mean, I mean, apart from on social media and in magazines, you know, um, and, and that's a very particular type of short form. I mean, because I love stories and I'm talking quality stories, like in terms of not just like an attention grabbing thing, not a clickbait thing, like an actual proper story about someone and their mum, you know, that can be told in a really, really short amount of words. And so I've tried to create something that you can hack into at any time. Yeah, you've really achieved that. It's really beautiful. And I mean, you know, for anybody who's seen any of the other books in this series, they're such a beautiful beautifully presented book they've got beautiful covers and if I can say I mean they're illustrated by Sean Tan who is hands down one of my favorite Australian like writers full stop but his art is just phenomenal so for anybody who's not familiar with his work I would really encourage you to have a look at it it's just magic he's an academy award-winning illustrator he's one of Australia's finest artists and I tracked him down and 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 badgered him um uh to help me and he has been so supportive and i still can't even believe that i can't even believe that 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 he's in like we're allowed to use his images i am so starstruck because he's one of my absolute heroes he, you're yeah. right he's he's one of he i look without you know pissing in the proverbial pocket um he is a true Australian icon. He he is very important when it comes to our cultural identity. Um, he's one of our, our best exports, one of our greatest talents. He's a living treasure. Anyone who's, um, I assume that a lot of people that are watching are literate with Sean Tan because he's had such a, a wide reaching effect uh, and, and, and all power to him. But anyone who's listening or watching that hasn't heard of Sean Tan, go down the rabbit hole and you'll come out so much richer. I can't even believe that 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 he's on our cover. <laughs> yeah, that was what I remember when Dear Santa first came out, and that actually for me was what what caught my eye with he's, it. Like he's, I, he's painfully shy and very hard to secure. So it was yeah. quite. He's quite the get. He's quite the get. I'm glad that you got him. And yeah, I would agree. I would really encourage anybody not familiar with his work to have a look at it. I think sometimes people think that illustrated stories are for children. But um, that's absolutely not the case. I think that they're for a really broad audience. I think, oh, which one have you got, Samuel? Well, oh, Cicada is lovely. That's a, that's a wonderful, wonderful book. Yep. What he's most famous for, perhaps. Um, he's uh, ubiquitous, the lost thing. Yeah, uh, and that was what they did, the um, Academy oh, Award winning. What about the from? arrival? The arrival's magnificent. You know, so, I mean, it's it, it, he is just, look... I've got a signed one. Look at that. Oh, nice. Can you see? Hang on. Let me try and get the light on it. Hang on. Hang on. There we go. See that? Beautiful. He does these amazing little critters. It's one of my most treasured possessions. I've got, I've got, I actually, I'm such a fan. When I asked him to help out the charity, I took all my books and forced him to sign them. <laughs> Oh, well, good on you. You've got to take opportunities when they present themselves. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm so I'm such a fan. Like you've touched, yeah, I just I go gooey just thinking about him. Because he hugged so, on all of my heartstrings. His pictures will make you feel things you didn't know you could feel. Like it's yeah. just he taps into the human condition in a way that very few artists can. And and he appeals to your humanness. On a yeah. level that you, you didn't even realise you were such a deep human until you read him, you know? Oh, I, it's a, look, I he's genuinely, like, one of my absolute favourites. So I'm sorry for anybody who didn't come tonight to hear me rave about how yeah, much yeah, I right. love Sean Tan. Oh, but... Oops, we're meant to be talking about Dear Mum and we're doing a bit like, <laughs> four, like an hour-long rant on Sean Tan. Here's to Sean Tan. <laughs> so... 
Samuel, can you tell us about how the series came to life? Where did the idea come from and how did you go about getting them all together? My tech guy that's in charge uh, at our charity for all things technical came up with the idea for Dear Santa and it was completely unique. Letters to Santa from Australian adults. Um, it was just too, there was, it was hook, line and sinker from the moment he mentioned it. From there, a villager suggested we do Dear Dad and from there, I got suggestions from the publisher, the villagers and the people and volunteers that work at Love Your Sister. They were all saying the whole time, when's Dear Mum? Um, so, and dear mum was when, when we were going to be ready to make it special. So I see all of these as stepping stones towards this one, because this has always been the crown jewel for us because, um, because of who we represent. So this was the one that I couldn't get wrong. I mean, I don't mind if I offend Santa and, um, <laughs> and because we're 86, 84 to 86%, um, women, I, like, I wasn't too worried about offending dads. I wanted very much to get this right because this is a an example of what our village is, and um, and I wanted mums with uh, and women um, to be able to read it and feel like I had done mums justice because mums are so important. All we have is love, and at the center of love is families, and at the center of families is mums. Now, my family's been affected by an absence of mums, but I'm still, as our life has still been dominated by our mums, whether, whether they're absent or not. And, and I don't know whether it's because I grew up without one or whether because Connie couldn't see, see her motherhood through that I've got such a thing about the importance of mums, but I have a deep sense of the significance of mums. Um, I, there's a lot of kind of, I was a stray kid and there were a lot of surrogate mums looking after me. So even though I didn't really have a mum the whole time and cause my mum opted out when I was three, I've, I've always put mums on a pedestal, um, and seen them as really vital. So to me, it was quite scary to do this cause it feels like it should be a book that's, that's actually edited or curated by, by a woman. Um, so I, it, so I had a I had a few hurdles to get over over in terms of feeling worthy enough to be able to kind of curate these stories because but I decided not to fall into the gender trap and uh, and not to worry because you know I mean I'm here on Connie's behalf anyway and Connie would love this book so it's not really about me anyway so I managed to get over all the head fuckery of it excuse my language and um and 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 produce this and I'm sure that my mum and my dad. Yeah that both now gone would be super proud. Oh, absolutely, Sam. And in your letter in the book, you talk about your mum and you talk yeah. about the experience of discovering a big bundle of poetry that she'd written. Um, you found them when you were about 20. Can you tell us a bit about that? Oh, mate, I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky. So my mum died when I was three and I grew up just without one and we didn't bring it up because... I didn't want to hurt my dad's feelings. So it was like, I, I was too scared to talk to dad about it. It's not like he discouraged it. It's just that I did not want to bring up something that might hurt his feelings. I didn't never wanted to see my dad hurt. Um, so I lived, I grew up with this ghost mum. no details. Oh, I knew she was a poet. I knew that I knew that she found life to be, you know, at times a dreadful and onerous undertaking. Um, but I knew very little. I knew she divided her times between the mental asylum and the commission flats. I knew that she collected chocolates for the queen. I knew, you know, I knew very little, just like just little bits of information. And then when I was 21, I found in my dad's filing cabinet, I was poking around there and I shouldn't have been. Um, but, but he, he need not ever know. And he never did. Um, um, and I, I was thumbing through my dad's filing cabinet to find a story I'd written to show my nephew who I was trying to look after at the time. And, um, I found 300 of my mum's poems handwritten in my dad's filing cabinet. And finally the window to my mum was open. Finally, the answers to my questions might be there. And, and so after I put John to bed, I sequestered the file in, into my bedroom and I, and I, I was shaking when I opened it and slowly page by page, I got to know my mum through these 300 handwritten poems that were, that were beautiful, whimsical, uh, bleak, sad, disconnected, you know, coherent, you know, there were so many different styles. There was, it was as if there was a poem to match every mood she'd been through. 
and I got to travel through my mother's personality on my own, sitting on the floor, cross-legged, poem after poem. And the second last poem I got to didn't was the first one without a title. And I was like, oh, there's no title on this one. It just said in brackets for Samuel Joseph. That's my name. My middle name's Joseph. And I found that my mum had written me a poem and I found it from the grave. And she wrote it about two months before she killed herself. And in it, she explains everything. And, and, and so this ghost mum that I grew up with, you know, and I, was, I just never thought I'd find the answers, came to me in these 300 handwritten poems. I keep the poem that she wrote for me on the wall in my study, which is my special place. And I have it protected in fire resistant glass. And that's my mum's own handwriting. And, um, and, and, and now I have my mum because I found my poem. Would you like to hear the last verse? Please. Um, it's quite a complicated poem before that. And then she just simplifies it into something really very simple and, and fundamental and elegant, I think. It, it finishes with all the seas of joy rise to sing for you, boy, surge and swell and roar. All the seas of joy sound wonderfully near since you've been here. Sam, that's so beautiful. And I'm really glad that you had the chance to discover that. So many people who've lost their mums would give anything for, for something my, like that. My, my two sisters didn't get that. Yeah. They didn't find their poems, you know. Like, I am so lucky. Every, every question answered, every doubt erased, proof that my mum loved me. And, 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 and perhaps a suggestion that maybe she didn't want me to live with the kind of pain that she carried with her. You know, um, and definitely, definitely absolved me of, of any responsibility I may have felt emotionally as a result of the absence or, you know, just the most gorgeous, gorgeous thing. And, and so I, I, I really feel like the luckiest boy in the universe, you know, and, and, and whether my mum was in pain and had to opt out when I was three or whether she was still here, I like to think that she raised a boy that could make this book regardless. So like, to me, it's not an homage to a, to a, to a dead mother. It's an homage to a mother that still lives with me through her poetry. Um, so it's not for me. It doesn't, it's for me, it's a happy thing for me. This is a way for me to write my poem back to her. Like, you know, maybe she'll find this book in a filing cabinet somewhere. Like I found her poem in a filing cabinet somewhere. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Like in 20 years time, she might stumble across this book in a filing cabinet somewhere. Like I know that's obviously ridiculous, patently ridiculous, but there's a certain kind of uh, romance and, and there's, a, there's a poetry to that that I like. Yeah. And, and given that she was a poet, I figure I might be thinking in the right kind of way. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. So Sam, I feel like this is a really, really mean question to ask you because there's so many to choose from. But is there a letter that stands out for you in the book as a favourite? Uh, well, I'll be honest because my dad raised me to be that. Yes, totally. There's a favourite. Um, um, absolutely. I have, I'm unashamed when I tell you that. Guy Pierce's letter um, stands above all of the rest for me. He wrote a... a simply stunning um, letter to his mother, an apology for not killing her. His mother never wanted to lose her mind. And of course she fell victim to dementia. And she'd always made a deal with her kids. If I lose my mind, make the call, make, you know, find a way. And they had a deal. And then when she got sick, the doctor came to Guy and gave him two options. Guy didn't see that the doctor was giving him a way out. Guy chose the obvious choice, which was to try and get her better because that's what a son would want. But in doing so, he missed the last opportunity that would present itself to get her out of the situation that she dreaded her whole life. So the letter is an apology to her 
for allowing her life to continue. Um, it's incredibly deep and rich and gut wrenching and honest. And um, I'm so glad all the letters aren't that heavy. <laughs> um, but you really get to know a side of Guy Pierce that you didn't know before. He's got a disabled sister and his mum's um, gone through a heck of a lot. And he, he's been really honest about about who he is and the family he comes from and he does and i'll tell you i'll tell you this off the record but he does an incredible amount of um charity work um under the cover of dark he only does stuff that he knows he won't get noticed doing um he's a true gem of an australian and he's kinder and more generous and more philanthropic and community minded than anybody would ever know and 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 it's his secret and it deserves to be his but i'm i'm kind of happy to touch on that because it deserves to be noted he's a, you know we need people like that our beacons to show us that next level of humanness that maybe we haven't attained yet i i salute guy pierce for his letter to his mother and i encourage everyone to read it it's um it's it's it'll take a piece of you forever yeah, look, I would agree with you. It was absolutely the letter Remarkable. I think that's, that stood out for me. And I would say to everybody at home that I mean, the whole every letter in there is wonderful in its own way. But I think that that will be the one that that people will. And that's not to diminish the other ones. People will love the others for similar reasons. And I love the others for for wonderful reasons. But when it comes to the indelible impact that that letter's had on me. It's just going to leave a richer mark than the other ones. And, and look, I mean, there's there's so many there's so many good examples. I think Shane Jacobson ends up finding a wife that's as kind as his mother, and that's one of the most beautiful letters. Um, Churia Pitt, um, who mo as most of us would know, went through a horrific uh, experience um, um, on a marathon with a fire. Um, her mum's really eccentric and haughty. And quite the character. Um, Amanda Keller only really understood her mum after she went, um, as so many of us do, the power of 2020. There's so many. Um, David Astle, I think, um, does a stunning kind of word, um, um, word puzzle for his mum that harks back to his childhood in a really, really tangible way. Vicar and Linda Bull's Tongan mother, so strong and direct and powerful. You really do get a sense in this book of how many different types of mothers there can be. And, yes. and, and as a guy that never really got that hang time with a mum, for me, that is fertile ground. It's fascinating stuff. I'm now able to look at 90 different mums who produced extraordinary children and, and, and to really get a sense beyond my mother's poetry of what is mo motherhood or mumming. And I will just say, just in case, like I'm giving the sense to people that it's that it's a sad book to read. It is. It is sad sometimes, but it's also very funny and moving. There's poems and songs in there. Yeah, and there's, also, plenty, there's plenty of stand-up comics that write for it too. It's just, yes. just that I can't transfer their hilarity quite as well. Yeah, and so it's like one of my favourite moments is that Brian Cannon from um, Shudo Echo, who I was a fan of when I was a young person, confesses to um, burning down the family shed. So I hope he's already told his mum about that before um, before she picks it up and finds out that way. Um, Brian Mannix's letter is is awesome. Um, we've also got a lot of legit writers as well. We tried yes. we, we tried not just to get the usual smattering of showbiz types. Mm. Uh, so we've got your Patty Newtons and your Rebecca Gibneys and your Guy Pierces, but at the same time, we've got a lot of legit writers as well. We've also got two Australians of the Year. We've also yes. we've also got some politicians, including Natasha Stott Despoja and Jackie Lambie, two yep. two more different politicians you couldn't find. Um, I'm really proud of of uh, of this um of this medley it's a really really good med medley all kinds of different mums and different kids really and, and a lot of it is light-hearted we've got uh, you know people like luke mcgregor who can't write a serious thing to save himself um but yeah i'm look i'm i'm not just trying to sell it it's something that i'm passionate about having curated it myself 
Samuel, we're getting close to the end of the hour and I'm keen to go over to audience questions because I know that there's going to be a lot of people who have them for you. But I wanted to ask you, just a few months ago, you made a video for Love Your Sister TV where you talk about how tough the pandemic has been um, on all of our mental health. And, again, it's not as serious as it sounds because your audience, when we see who you're speaking to, is perhaps not who we would have anticipated you were talking to about mental health issues. But, um, you know, you're asking people to be kinder to themselves and kinder to each other, which I think is an important thing for us all to take away. How's the pandemic been for you? Um, we've we've done surprisingly well as a charity. A lot of uh, other charities are in uh, much more strife than we are. Um, we've got a really dedicated uh, base of regular givers. Um, we've lost very few of them because we don't ask much of them. Um, and um, and I've I, we pivoted straight into sex toys and um, and hand sanitizer, um, and and um, and managed to survive um, the upheaval. Um, we've, we've never been in better shape. We raised only $50,000 less in the COVID year than we raised the year before. So we raised about 2.1 million the year before COVID and we raised 2.05 million during COVID. So, um, so, um, I'm, I'm sitting in a very, very, um, good place and in a much better place than many others. And if I was to say anything at this point, I'd encourage people to look to other charities to support because we're, we're one of the few that are still doing okay. Um, most, most other charities rely on face-to-face -face time that they can't get now. We've got a really, really strong and loyal following on social media and online, which has allowed us to survive really well. So things couldn't be going better. But at the same time, you know, we're obviously dealing um, with a lot of um, real-time problems in terms of people are struggling. And it's like everyone's got cancer now. It's like everyone's, yeah. as, it's like everyone is as stressed as a cancer family now. <laughs> it's like, it's almost like the, the stress that I see that's particular to families experiencing cancer is now really widespread. So, I mean, our message is stay curious and be kind. Um, you know, it's, that's our, that's our ethos. That's our philosophy is, you know, tr try never to be so hurt that you can't maintain a basic level of curiosity and try as best as you can to be kind first to yourself so that you can then be kind to others. And, and that's certainly held me in good stead and held many of our villages in good stead. And, and that's at the heart of our hippie ethos. And apart from that, say what you think and stand up and, and fight and, and, you know, fight tooth and nail, you know, we've also got a lot of character behind that. That sounds like a pretty good ethos, Samuel. Um, I'm going to go over to audience questions. Now, before I start, I want to say chances are we're not going to get a chance to go through all of them, so I apologise okay. to anybody that we miss. But I would also encourage you, if you just have a comment for Samuel rather than a question, feel free to type it in because I'll send them through to him afterwards. Please. I have the, yeah, one of the things about doing these events is that's a shame is that you don't get the chance to have those those chats with people at the signing table. So yeah. I really encourage you if you would like to do that to do so. Okay, now I have a question from Rowena who um, is just asking if you're happy in your personal life. Yeah, I really am uh, for the first time ever, really. Um, I've, I've never been more stable. Uh, most people who have been along the journey with me know how unstable I am. They know how volatile I, I am. They know a lot about my mental health history, my history with drugs and alcohol. Um, my, my, I come from a fairly, um, a fairly dysfunctional kind of background and, um, and I'm pleased to report that I'm really healthy. And that um, I'm eating well, resting well, getting up early, working hard, applying myself properly and making sure that I don't waste these opportunities that are in front of me. Rowena, thank you for asking. I've never been better and I've never, um, I've never felt more resolved or determined or motivated, despite the fact that I'm thoroughly exhausted after having visited 1100 communities in the last seven years. Thank you, Sam. Um, Karina's asking if Love Your Sister will be coming to Hornsby, which is my library, when you get back on the road. Um, so yeah, I'm going to do New South Wales, hopefully towards the end of the year, and there's no way I'm not coming to see you, Mel. You're gonna thank you, Samuel. You're going to you're gonna have to host us. Um, oh. I, would, I would love to come to Hornsby. That's been noted. I've written it down now. I'll take it to my team. We'll be back in touch, and hopefully I'll be there later this year. Uh, I've been waiting to get into New South. Um, I've got a, we've, we've got so many um, wonderful supporters in that area. I also need to see Miriam and go for a swim with her and her gang. Um, so hopefully at the end of the year. 
Well, nothing would make us happier. Um, Kerry Jane is asking what you wanted to do with your life career-wise if you didn't have, if, if, Well, I think she's, I've, I've not read that out very nice. Was, was her name Kerry? It's Kerry Jane. Kerry Jane. Oh, I love um, that. I, I think um, she's, she's saying if you hadn't had this unexpected yeah. chain of events, where do you think you'd yeah. be? Um, <laughs> I certainly, um, I, I always wanted to be a writer, um, and, um, I never thought I'd be become an actor or a fundraiser or a, or a cancer advocate. And, um, thankfully I am starting to write more. Um, so I'm exactly where I want to be and I'm doing what I always imagined myself doing. And I've managed to find a way to do what I love to, that helps support the charity. What I love is, is books and stories and words. And this is like our fifth book and we're raising many millions of dollars through books. So for me, I'm, I'm tapping into, um, into that vein that I want to be mainlining from, you know, it's, um, exactly where I want to be. I, I, I like to think that if I didn't do the charity, stuff i would have ended up in this study reading and writing just as i am now good um samuel dean is asking what advice you give to young kids who are dealing with cancer um yeah i think we've got to be careful not to um not to superhero our young people with cancer not to tell them that, that they're doing well because of their mindset or because they've got, you know, they, you know, they've got more willpower. We often mythologize kids who recover from cancer and we give them a bit of a superhero syndrome. We need to encourage them in their efforts to combat the disease without, um, without creating a, um, a myth or an ideology around it. Um, there is no right way for a kid to handle it um all i can beg of you is that you provide an honest haven for that for that child my sister could come home to a house where um where she was safe supported listened to um and catered to and and understood as best as possible keep doing what you're already doing which is that i'm sure um but there's not much more than that that you can do um, because there's nothing more heart wrenching to go through. Um, I only have to take one look at a kid with cancer and, and I break into bits and pieces. So was it Dean? Was it Dean? Yes. Um, Dean, um, try and maintain a semblance of norm normalcy. Try not to let everything be dictated by the cancer and try and create a bubble away from the cancer. We tried to get Connie off doing things to forget that she ever had cancer. So, mm. um, and I'm sure that, um, that he's already doing that. So I'd, in, I, so I'd encourage him to keep doing that because the most important thing for a child with cancer and be careful of the siblings as well, because they often go through just as much. Um, the most important thing is that you provide a haven separate to the treatment, separate to the doctors, separate, separate to the hospitals. Um, and um, home won't always provide that. Sometimes you've got to get them out of their comfort zone and yours um, to get them back into the moment. Um, but really, I'm the least qualified person to say so, even though I grew up in a family with a kid with cancer. Um, take, take that advice um, at face value and it's not worth more than a grain of salt. Please don't take it too seriously. Okay. Denise is asking, if you ever actually do relax, what do you like to do for relaxation? Yeah, look, um, when I need to relax, um, I, I must walk or ride my bicycle or be in nature. Um, I'll show you where I live. Um, nice. It's, um, you know, for me to cope, I need to be away from everything. Um, so I really rely on what I call the big mother, mother nature. It's the big mother and, 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 and I worship her and I, I kneel at her altar. So for me, I rely on nature to offset my, um, my hyponess. Um, also, I rely on exercise, boxing, skipping, walking, running, cycling, shooting hoops, um, really anything physically that gets me, that gets me walking. Um, but otherwise to relax, I concentrate hard on my breathing. I do a lot of um, meditation before I sleep in an effort to slow my mind, but also I find reading really helps me sleep. So, you know, if, if I'm to have effective rest and to slow down this um, maniac mind, then it definitely involves staying away from screens as soon as I'm um, lying in bed, it's really staying away from the screen time, making sure I don't have something on in the background and making sure that I'm 
dealing with who I am at the end of every day in an honest and silent way. So yeah, I do a lot of heavy breathing, a lot of um, a lot of meditative breathing, and a lot of reading to to rest my um, my manic mind at night. Thank you for asking. Good luck. Good luck with trying to slow down yours. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of people are sending you beautiful um, comments. <clears throat> I beg your pardon, and I want to acknowledge them and say thank you. And as I say, I'm going to send those all through to Santa. Please to have do, a look and, at. and anyone who's written them, thank you for sending them, and I will read them gratefully. Um, Matt is asking if you think that you'll ever go back to acting again because she's a big fan. I went back last year um, and it'll be out. Um, I, I said I wouldn't act again until we raised 10 million because it was really um, stultifying my efforts as a fundraiser being on set 12 hours a day. So yeah, I got back to it last year on a show called Eden. Um, it's made by Stan, the streaming service Stan um, and it'll be out in June. And um, yeah, I dipped my toe back in last year and who knows what's, who knows what will happen again. But, I mean, never say never. But yeah, I thought I thought I'd scratch the itch again, and um, unfortunately, it was everything I remembered it to be. <laughs> okay, so we've got a million dollar idea here from somebody who's anonymous, so oh, yeah? we don't even need to Bring pay it. royalties Bring it. or anything. <laughs> so they're saying, um, are you planning to do another book in the series of letters? And their suggestion is that you oh. could do one called Dear Me, which are letters to ourselves about what. This is great minds. Um, we have discussed Dear Me. I think it's the only one left that's doable. Um, like we've had Dear, you know, Dear Dog, Dear Pet, Dear, we've had ideas for a lot of them. The only one I think that's really interesting, that's really got legs, if we do another one, would be Dear Me. Um, she's touched on the one um, concept that's left remaining. Um, I think that we could get some really interesting people um, to write letters to themselves that would be fascinating to read. Um, that's only encouraged me more strongly to suggest it at the next board meeting. Um, well, I, I just kind of feel like this should be the end and we should quit while we're ahead. I don't want, I don't want to kind of milk it and end up petering out. So, But if we were to go again, dear me, would be the only way we'd go, I, I would suggest. Okay, there you go, Anonymous. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank um, you. <laughs> um, Sandra's asking um, if you're planning on, on writing a book next. So I guess she's wondering if you're <laughs> planning to write your own work of non-fiction or fiction. Uh, yes, I am. I'm doing it this year. Um, I'm only on the road for about 12 or 14 weeks this year so that I can concentrate on my writing. Um, my sister, I, I've been playing Muse and Wingman for my sister and I spent years trying to get that novel out of her that came last year. Um, and now that that's out, I feel like she's thrown the gauntlet down and that I need to respond. So me and Hilda are in a, are in a bit of an arms race when it comes to our writing and we're using each other to, uh, to inspire each other to write more. I'm writing a lot. Um, I'm writing two separate things um, concurrently. Um, I tend not to set my mind to things that 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 won't that won't get there, and I anticipate um, having two projects to read um, by next year. Um, in fact, I'm spending all of my mornings in this room writing away diligently and I'm trying to be as good a writer as my sister and as good a writer as my dad and as good a writer as my mum. I think we're all looking forward to seeing that, Samuel. Um, <laughs> we're getting lots of requests for visits to um, individual libraries, so I'll just send those through oh, to can you. <laughs> can you? Because I will look at them. I, trust me. We'll get more of them now that you've said right. that. Great. Um, I mean, to be honest, I've done a lot of retail visits to Bunnings and MCALs and IGAs, and I'm really grateful for them, but I need some libraries. So please, thank you yeah, for inviting come and me. See, yeah. uh, careful, what you, careful what you wish for, because I might end up there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm just going through, and I think we've got time for one last question, and I'm just filtering through. Mostly I'm just saying lots and lots of love and thank yous no. to you, Samuel. Um, but I want to say... If um, okay, I think. Look, this is uh, this is a nice one to end on. I suppose this is Annette. Um, she's saying, "What advice would you have for her? Um, she's a mum, and her daughter is finding things really difficult because she lost her dad twelve months ago. What 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 can you say to a little kid who's in that experience?" Um, well, my sister touches on it um, in a letter that she wrote that didn't end up published in Dim. Um, um, it's something they can only go through alone. Um, my, my sister, my sister lost, found her mum dead when she was 12. 
um, and um, and Connie's kids have lost their mum when they were 11, 10 and 11. Um, there's no right time to lose a parent and there's little that you can do or say to ease the pain and hardship of it. Um, you can merely be there. Um, there's nothing that you can say that can ameliorate the pain. You can merely be there. Um, and eventually, time does not heal all wounds. That's not a truism. Let's not fall into that trap. Um, the wound will live on and she will die with that wound. And we need to not pretend that there's a right time to tie that into a neat little bow and call it closure. There won't be closure. Let's not offer a neat solution that isn't there. Um, my suggestion would be be there um, and, and uh, both, both during the fog and once the fog lifts. But we, no matter what we do, that fog will sit there for as long as the fog needs to sit there. My um, two nephews are just starting to come out of their shell now and it's been quite some time since they lost their mum. Um, and, and there's precious little I'm afraid that we can do about that apart from be present and apart from trying to fill their lives with as much joy as possible in so far as you can. It's an awful time. It's, it, it's meant to be that, um, it's going to characterize her into the future. And, and I'm afraid that as far as I'm concerned, all you can do is merely be there for her. There's not anything more that you could be doing that you aren't already doing. It, 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 you, if we could lift the fog, we'd lift it for them. But unfortunately, um, as my sister says, and I rely on my sister, um, she says it's 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 a battle that must be fought alone for any kid that loses a parent, and um, and and I'm so sad um, that to even suggest that, but it's 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 how it is uh, in our experience. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Um, really. Oh, look. I'm just. I've got a comment here from Please. Catherine. Who Catherine was the person who sent through the idea for Dear Me. So thank you, Catherine. We're acknowledging you by name now. Is it with um, a C? Yes. With a, yeah. Okay. Catherine cool. with the same. Okay. Great. Um. So I guess this is time for us to let Samuel go because there are just so many comments coming through that I could keep you here all night. Um. I want to say thank you so much to everybody at home for joining us. We've recorded this and we will share it on our YouTube Can channel. Can you share so it to me too? Because I want it. <laughs> I will absolutely share it with you as well. Okay. Samuel, cool. So it'll be available for people to watch and I'll try and get that loaded up um, tomorrow. So it'll be available nice and soon for you to share with anybody who you think would like it. And just to close before we say goodbye, um, can yes. I encourage anyone who's watching or listening um, to hire this book, or, uh, to lend the book from their library, but also if they do want to purchase one for their mum, as much as we love people to use their retail bookstores, if they buy the book through us, a lot more of it will go to cancer research because we can yes. cut out cut out the middleman. So if anybody listening or watching does want to buy a copy of the book, if they order it from us, I can sign a message to your mum. I can. I'm happy to sign a copy. Just leave me a note in the uh, in the order comments. So if anybody watching does want to buy it, if if they're in a position to do so, um, um, they can visit loveyoursister.org and click on our market, and um, and and let me know what you need, and I'll personalise it um, as as you see fit. Just in case there's one of the three people that still have a job left watching. <laughs> <laughs> thank you Samuel we've been sharing the link for the website there, oh, so thanks. people have got that and they'll be able to do that um so uh, if I may very cheekily my mum is a big fan of your Samuel and she's watching tonight with my nana um so I just want to say hello to them because what, um, what's her name my mum's name is Jan um and she put it in the family group chat where normally people talk about, you know, when their kids got made class captain or something like that. But mum put my big event in there for everybody. Um, to Jan, say. Jan, I'm signing my own personal copy of the book to you. And Mel's, Mel's got my email. She's going to let me know where to send it. Happy Mother's Day from Mel and from me. And we love you. Oh, Samuel, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you have to email me with your address. Otherwise, it'll fall over. <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, Samuel, genuinely, thank you so much for being with us tonight. It's been such an absolute pleasure and honour to speak with you. Um, we look forward to seeing you when you come out to New South Wales and you get a chance to visit some of our libraries. I know people will be looking forward to it. 
it's my pleasure. I'm really honored. Um, and, and thank you so much for having me and for giving um, some time to me. I really appreciate it. it it's not lost on me. Anytime. Good yeah. night, Sam, and good night, everybody. Thank you good. so much.